All right, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are joining us, and welcome to the 2021 Lanes and Press Pass. I'm Scott Hazelton. I'll be serving as your host here today, and uh, most certainly, uh, we wish we could all be uh, sitting in that uh, beautiful stallion barn there at Lanes End, catching up and taking a look at these stallions and, and telling stories of the last year, but we all know the circumstances in which we are uh, still facing here at the early portion of 2021. This is the third year that Lanes End has been kind enough to put this together for the press and give back to those of us that have committed ourselves uh, to the industry through the media. And uh, we certainly do appreciate their uh, continued to commitment to those of us in the media and how kind and uh, they have been to us over the, uh, the last several decades, uh, bottom line, 40 plus years there at Lanes End. We will kick things off and go in alphabetical order of this Lanes End Stallion show and start with Accelerate. For more on Accelerate, here is noted Bloodstock agent John Moynihan on his impression of Accelerate's first foals. I first you know, noticed Accelerate, obviously, when he you know, won the Breeders' Cup and he came to stud and I went out and looked at him. And physically, he's a, he's a beautiful horse, you know, from the smart strike line. And, and if, you know, he, he just he embodied if he made pretty horses, um, you know, I think he'd have a real chance at stud when he initially went to stud. And, you know, what really caught my attention was this past November. And um, a lot of the consignments that I went to, starting in book one, uh, book two, you know, et cetera, every day that I'd go back through and go back through my notes and a lot of the good looking weanlings that I make my short list from, you know, every day there was an accelerate or two or three each day. And that's when I really started taking notice. I mean, he is really making a horse, producing a horse uh, that kind of embodies himself. Uh, you know, they're good looking, they're athletic, um, you know, they're engineered to run. And that's what really caught my attention. Smart Strike's been, you know, such an influence on our breed, you know, as a great stallion, as a great broodmare sire. Um, you know, of course we have Curlin, you know, at Stone Street, who's also by Smart Strike. So it, you know, kind of holds a special place in, you know, our spot. And, um, you know, I, I, th I think, you know, he's got a real, real chance to make it. You know, these horses, when they produce physical horses that uh, are athletic and are engineered to run, it's been my experience over the years that those are the ones that tend to get runners, uh, uh, you know, at different points in their career, whether it be two-year-olds, whether it be three-year-olds. Um, but they definitely get runners, you know, at some point. And I think that's very encouraging for, uh, for Accelerate. Uh, it's been my experience that, you know, uh, if they produce really pretty foals, they're going to produce pretty yearlings. And uh, a lot of times those pretty yearlings turn out to be pretty two-year-olds. And, and when they're pretty, uh, when they're engineered to run like that, they usually get runners. The first impressions were, you know, obviously people gravitate and always have expectations for the really high priced uh, stallions that go to stud uh, regarding their stud fees, the high priced stud fees. You know, what was uh, what really caught my eye with Accelerate, you know, he's at a price point in the market where he's extremely affordable to breeders that, you know, that, that can also produce a horse that can sell for many more times the stud fee that it costs to breed the horse. And I think with Accelerate, you know, that's a, that's a huge advantage, you know, to a breeder. And that price point for Accelerate, the five-time grade one winner, 17,500 is what he stands for in 2021 at Lanes End Farm. Some high praise from one of the uh, top eyes, top minds in the bloodstock world, that being John Moynihan. Uh, we move on to the stalwart that is Candy Ride, and let's go to pedigree consultant Alan Porter on Candy Ride's lasting impact on the breed. You know, to look at the impact of Candy Ride properly, it's it's probably very helpful to place him in context, to remember that he came from Argentina where he was unbeaten in three starts, was champion minor, to winning two grade one races there. Um, and then in the U.S., he ran was three for three also, um, won an allowance on the dirt, the American handicap on the turf, and then... Final start, trying 10 furlongs for the first time, gave him an astonishing display to, in the Pacific Classic where he beat Medagliadoro by nearly four lengths, set a new track record and won a buyer speed figure of 123. Now, despite that, he went to stud on the heels of some other South American horses that had been disappointing at stud. And in terms of um, stud fee, you know, he started off at a very, very mod modest stud fee with fairly low expectations. 
Uh, despite that, he then came up with uh, grade one winners, misremembered Captain Candyman, El Brujo, and Eva Eva Argentina, his first crop. Then he came up with Turning Candy and Sydney's, Can uh, Sydney's Candy, both grade one winners, his second crop. And he's never looked back from then. And for the better part of a decade, you know, he's been a horse you have to consider when you're doing mating plans for major stud farms. You know, when you look to the future of Candy Wright and you look to see where his sire line might go with his sons, the prospects are very promising. I mean, he's still at stud. He's still receiving top class mares. We've got a lot to come. But he's already had four sons who sire graded stakes winners. He's got six young sons at stud in Kentucky at the moment. Um, now you've got the oldest of these is Twirling Candy. He's already established himself as a graded stakes sire, consistent graded stakes sire. He's already got a grade one winning son, Giftbox, who retires to stud for this coming year. He's got another horse, Collusion Illusion, who's a grade one winning sprinter last year, who will probably be at stud in the near future. So he's already extending the generation of the Candy Ride line. Um, of the others, other five sons are studying Kentucky, two are champions, and one's going to be an Eclipse Award finalist this year. Uh, if you take those by age, you've got Gunrunner, who was a horse of the year. You've got Unified, a three-time graded stakes winner and a grade one placed horse that came very close to winning a grade one in the Carter. You've got Mastery, who's an undefeated game uh, grade one winner. You have Game Winner, undefeated champion two-year-old Breeders' Cup winner. So, you know, you've got top-class horses. They are all well-received, all with terrific opportunities. And certainly continues to make an impact himself. Uh, here's a horse that we just saw debut at Santa Anita last week by the name of Rockier World, who was so impressive at Santa Anita, uh, going six furlongs out of the chute. So Candy Ride continuing to produce, standing for 75000 at Lane's End Farm for 2021. Let's move on to a horse that we were introduced to last year, a horse that is nicknamed the Cruiser, one of the best-looking ones, Catalina Cruiser. Catalina Cruiser. He won seven of nine starts coast to coast with six triple digit buyers and five dominating graded stakes wins, including a record in the grade two true north stakes, a son of leading fifth crop sire Union Rags, a $370,000 yearling with an imposing physical and one of the best of his generation. There's only one Catalina Cruiser now standing at Lane's End. There truly is only one Catalina Cruiser. We had, I had the pleasure of being out here on the West Coast and, and watching this horse and getting a chance to see him firsthand. Just in a, a remarkable individual who will be standing for 15000 uh, here in 2021. And a man that uh, really has had a big hand from start to now where he's at right now is David Engordo. David, uh, explain to, to our, uh, our folks out there that are joining us how impactful this horse was during his racing career. You know, the, the true north, I've, in doing this, you, you go back and you're studying about these horses. And his true north was as good a race as any horse ran um, in 2019. And, and we, you know, we were a little disappointed at the Breeders' Cup that he didn't win. Um, I mean, John was as confident as I've ever seen him in both years that we ran there. But, but I don't know, I, I'm kind of at a loss for words with him because – when I see those pictures, I hadn't gone and seen him in a while, and, and he's just matured and about as good a horse talent-wise as we have in the stallion barn up there. What has been the impressions from those that have had a chance? Have you heard from, from folks that have had a chance to come out and see him at the farm, David? You know, I always tease everybody. They'll say, oh, you like all your horses. And I'll say, listen, if you drive out here or fly or whatever and you don't like them, I'll pay for your gas. I've yet to pay for anybody's gas yet. <laughs> well, that certainly is something. And uh, Catalina Cruiser, um, like I said, we had a chance for those of us who were lucky enough to come out last year uh, to see him when he was introduced. He is a stunning individual. He truly is a uh, lane zen through and through, once again, standing for 15000 in 2021. Let's move on to City of Light and to noted Bloodstock agent Mike Ryan uh, talking about City of Light's appeal. A city of light, he's, he's a magnificent physical, an unbelievable equine specimen. Um, 
I think he was one of the most highly recruited horses of his generation. Uh, every major stud farm was trying to get him to stand as a stallion. And for obvious reasons, he, he was the complete package. He's a magnificent individual. He has a top class pedigree and his race record is incredible. Grade one winner at three, three, four and five, over seven furlongs, a mile and a mile and an eighth. And that's hard to accomplish. Very few horses can boast that. Um, he, he's one of the nicest looking horses standing at stud in central Kentucky today, in my opinion. It wasn't a surprise to me that his foals look so good because I have found through the years that these magnificent looking stands like Ali Dar's secretariat, deputy minister, they have the, the gene strength to reproduce themselves. And when they're really, really good physicals, it seem to be pretty common fact that they'll transmit them to their offspring. And it was no exception in this horse. His foals were very well grown. They had size, substance, quality, strength, and they had a they had an aura of class uh, and presence about them. There was an eliteness to them. They're good movers. They uh, they were and they were very consistent. It wasn't a fluke. It wasn't just that one or two were big big selling horses. You know, twelve or fourteen sold. They averaged two sixteen. The median was one hundred and seventy two. That's average was six times the stud fee and the median was five times the stud fee. Pretty extraordinary for a first crop sire. But um, they were they were consistently well-made, well-conformed quality horses. And the market just, he was second only to justify as a freshman sire in his average and median. And as a breeder, I, I have a share in the horse and I have two homebreds by him and they are very, very good. So... Uh, what we saw on the farm from a small sample was was uh, consistent. What we saw the, when they were presented at the sales. City of Lights uh, standing for forty thousand dollars and a horse that really closed out his career with a bang with his wins in the Breeders' Cup uh, Dirt Mile and then capping it off with that sensational run at Gulfstream Park in the Pegasus World Cup. He'll be standing again for forty thousand dollars in twenty twenty one. Let's move along. To the next stallion, Connect. Connect, the next in line to carry on Lane's End's tried and true stallion tradition. A grade one winning millionaire's son of Curlin, physically impressive and dominant on the track. Winner of the grade one Cigar Mile and the grade two Pennsylvania Derby, where he defeated Gunrunner, Nyquist, and Exaggerator. With multiple six-figure yearlings in his first crop, up to $360,000. Connect, a proven winner on the track, a proven stallion in the making. Obviously, being a son of Curlin and his race record uh, speaks for itself, but I want to bring in Lane's Ends, Alaire Ryan, to discuss Connect. And what has been the uh, the feedback of the uh, first uh, first group of horses that we've seen from this son of Curlin, Connect? Um. Hi, Scott. Yeah, it's definitely an exciting time of year to kind of pull the uh, pre-training centers that have these uh, now two-year-olds by first crop stallions like Connect. And in talking to um, several of them that are in Ocala, the consensus was the Connects are very nice and there's a lot of resemblance um, of the stallion, not just in the physicals that they have, but the way they move. Um, the ability that they're showing um, with what they're being asked of so far at these training centers. Um, Eddie Woods had Connect as a young horse, and he said um, he has a number of them, in fact, for um, the late Mr. Pompa as well. And he said they're all quiet, very classy acting horses uh, that train honestly. So he's very pleased with what he's seen of them so far. Um, and he thinks that like the stallion, they're probably going to take some time. Um, connected start in the fall of his two-year-old year, but didn't break his mane until May of his three-year-old uh, campaign. And then capped that off with wins in the Pennsylvania Derby and the Cigar Mile. Um, a couple other people that I've talked to in Ocala have said that um, Carl Keegan, for example, said he's got a two-turn filly that has a lot of quality, but she also trains with a bit of pace too. So she might be one that heads to the OBS March sale 
Um, she's definitely a select type. And he said he's also got a colt that is just a beast of a horse. Um, now, Brandon mentioned that he's got a filly that's just so straightforward. She's going to sell herself based off the way she trains. So there's some positive energy going on down there. Um, obviously, they're looking forward to asking a little bit more of them as they kind of figure out what they're pointing towards uh, the select two-year-old sales and which ones will be kind of kept to race. But um, there's plenty to be excited about. And the consensus was that the connects are, are training as good as any two-year-olds by proven stallions that are down there. So that was exciting to hear. Uh, great stuff, Valer. And uh, Connect, you'll look for him at Lane's End in 2021 for $15,000. We we move along to a horse that uh, made quite a splash uh, in the racing scene in America, and Lane's End did along with him, and that is Daredevil, the sire of She Dares the Devil, and of course, Swiss skydiver uh, Chance Tim of Lane's End joins us now to discuss Daredevil. Uh, how big was this to get him to Lane's End? Yeah, thanks, Scott. It, it was huge, obviously. I mean, it, as it's been publicized, the, the, most every major farm was after him, so we feel very fortunate to have him. And, you know, I think for me, it's we're all aware of his accomplishments, but, you know, it, it's important to put it into perspective just how remarkable they are. Uh, for example, when She Dares the Devil and Swiss Skydiver won two in the Kentucky Oaks, uh, that's only happened 12 times in history. That's 585 runnings of classic races where Asire is sired the one, too. It's just un unbelievable. Um, you know, he's the only first crop sire to ever have an individual winner of Preakness and the Oaks. Um, my dad, did it with Rachel Alexander, and, you know, he obviously needs no introduction as to what he's achieved in his career. You know, he's among the best stallions this year, uh, Curlin and Tappet with two individual grade one winners. So and this all puts him in, you know, rarefied air. And, you know, I think most what's most impressive is these two fillies are really what makes grade one American dirt racing what it is. They have speed, they show speed, they press the pace and they don't stop and they can win these top class races going long on the dirt. And that's really what American racing is all about. So, you know, this horse is doing something pretty remarkable and we feel very fortunate to have him and you know, think that he's very much poised to continue to do that. He's from a very important sire line. He's the only proven son of more than ready in central Kentucky. Uh, that sire line is already fairly rare in this country. So, you know, he has a very unique capability to do what he's doing and also a very unique position to carry on a very important sire line uh, for you know this country in the breed. Well, I, we applaud you for uh, getting him back here into the United States and certainly breeders, buyers, uh, the thoroughbred racing world is uh, happy to have Daredevil back here in the United States. He'll stand for two, in 2021, he'll stand for $25,000 at Lane's End. We move along in our stallion parade virtually as we move on to the champion game winner. As a two-year-old, he was just phenomenal. I think that two-year-old form is so important, especially when they can take it to that championship level, and he brought it to that championship level. Rebel Stakes, he still ran the most impressive race, just getting beat a nose by Omaha Beach. He was a brilliant racehorse, he showed brilliance, and he throws brilliance. And game winner, you know, the minute he showed that brilliance, I knew right there we had something really special. Champion two-year-old, game winner. Undefeated as a juvenile, including three grade one wins in the Del Mar Futurity, American Pharaoh Stakes, and the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. By perennial leading sire, Candy Ride. From the immediate female family of champion Fleet Indian. New for 2021. In his first year at stud, he will stand for $30,000 at Lane's End Farm. And it's my pleasure now to bring in Mr. Bill Farish to talk about the, this, this latest champion to, to add, uh, be added to the Lane's End Stallion roster. And uh, first of all, Bill, we appreciate you having us here in this, uh, this press event uh, virtually via Lane's End. But uh, why was it so important to get game winner uh, to Lane's End? Well, first of all, Scott, welcome, everybody. I apologize uh, for 
for getting uh, having a hard time getting on. But um, uh, Scott, I think you, you said it all in that ad for us. Uh, uh, he, he was uh, he was he was a very important horse for us to get because uh, for a lot of reasons. But we sold him as a yearling to Gary and Mary West. Um, he you know buy candy ride out of an AP and E mare. He just just has so many things. Um, that uh, it, it's almost surprising we didn't we don't have the honor of having bred him because he's he's, he's bred exactly how we would we would hope. But uh, to have him go on from the yearling sales and run early as a two year old, win three Grade Ones, become champion two year old. Um, you know we were very very keen to get him at that point, and then it, and uh, unfortunately so was everybody else. So so we had a uh, quite a negotiation to get him. But uh, you know he he just is is a very exciting young horse, and uh, so far the breeders have really responded. He's got a phenomenal first book uh, so far, and and uh, he's closed down already, and uh, that's a, a great sign for any young horse. It certainly is, and uh, the champion game winner standing for thirty thousand dollars again. That will be his initial stud fee at Lane's End for two thousand and twenty-one. We move all along to another. New Stallion at Lane's End, another grade one winner, Gift Box. Introducing Gift Box, winner of the grade one Santa Anita Handicap. He's a three-time graded stakes winning millionaire with four triple digit buyers and a four ragazin to his name. He proved himself early as a graded stakes place two-year-old and now his career as a stallion is just getting started. From the first crop of the leading sire twirling candy out of a multiple graded stakes producing mare. Gift Box, new for 2021 only at Lane's End. And he will start off for $10,000 at Lane's End in 2021, his first year at Stallion. Alice Empson of Lane's End Farm joins me here to discuss gift box. Uh, Alice, first of all, good afternoon. Secondly, what is he? what kind of a horse is he like to be around? Um, he's a really nice uh, horse to be around. We did raise him from a weanling to a yearling. Um, unlike a lot of the candy rides and twirling candies, uh, you know, they're very amenable horses, good-minded, uh, and I think that's um, a big part of the equation uh, down the road. I think trainers are able to get the most out of these horses because they're willing to work and they want to work. Um, I think he'd be very attractive to a lot of breeders for, for several reasons. Um, you know, he's a very consistent, durable horse. He ran 18 times, was only off the board twice. Um, from a physical standpoint, um, you know, you can see why he was so durable and consistent. He's very correct, great through his knees. He's got a big fluid walk, like a lot of the twirling candies do. Um, you know, from a pedigree standpoint, you know, I think at this price point, you'll find a lot of horses that that were just kind of a, have weak pedigrees and were a flash in the pan um, that just outran their pedigrees. But th this horse is out of a, an exceptional mare that's had three graded stakes winners. She's a half sister to a grade one winner. So he really ran true to his pedigree. Um, and, you know, at the price point we have him, I think he ought to be very attractive to uh, breeders, especially being free from Stormcat and APND, which are both lines that have been very successful with the Twirling Candy and uh, Candy Ride Cross. Well, as you said, the price point uh, is right there to, to jump in. $10,000 for Gift Box, the grade one winner, good looking gray. New to Lane's End in 2021. Speaking of good-looking horses, we move along to Honor AP. Honor AP um, showed a lot of talent in the sense that he got over the ground really nicely. Um, he, when he was working, it was it almost seemed effortless, and he, you know, he never really he hit the ground so lightly, and he got into his next stride so easily that it was always a little deceiving. So uh, as a trainer, you know, you're watching your horse work and you're getting a feeling for how he's doing. And then you look down at the stopwatch and you go, oh my gosh, he actually did that. And that's the feeling I got with uh, Honor AP. Well, he was precocious. Um, he, he won as a two-year-old. He won going around two turns as a two-year-old. So I think that showed a lot of ability. Well, repeatable performances starts early in a horse. 
Uh, when you start to work them, you like to see them to be able to repeat that workout over again and just take that speed that they showed at, at a half and go to five with it or go to six with it. So being a horse being able to repeat that is very important. And then when you get to the afternoons, because um, there's a lot more going on for a horse to adjust to in the afternoon and their adrenaline's really pumping. So you think sometimes, well, I wonder if they overdid it and can they do it again? Can they get to that next, that same level or improve? And so that's, I, I think, the really important thing when a horse performs at a very high level, if they're in the 90s and the 100 buyers and they're doing it repeatedly, that's a great indication of a really nice, nice horse. And it was good because his talent, talent made him good. He was not particularly mature. He was not really a mature two-year-old, uh, but his talent made him seem to be that way. He, he always got over the ground well. Um, that's the, one of the first things I noticed about him was how lightly he, he got over the ground. He never pounded it, and he was really, really good at, with a huge stride, a length of stride you can't believe. So um, just his sheer talent made him a, a threat as a two-year-old. Uh, when, he, when he got a little bit older, he got stronger, which is something you uh, look for. Is, and uh, he got, well, he got stronger, he got bigger. And uh, so he was really, he was maturing, but he was not maturing quickly. So um, I think he, he was one of those uh, athletes that was just ahead of this class. Honor AP is uh, a very intense horse. He's a uh, hundred percent man, as you would say. You know, he's just a big, strong guy. And, and his qualities are really amazing because he has a forearm like Paul Bunyan has a forearm, right? He's just strong. You just see his strength. And then he has got a nice long back that gives him a great length of stride. And his hocks, he's got hocks that are very clean and large and strong. So he's got a lot of drive from his hind end. So his, his confirmation is just perfect for a racehorse. And John Sheriff's uh, even said in that uh, same interview that he thinks that he might be the best three-year-old that he's ever trained. And that's saying something considering He'd won the uh, Kentucky Derby in the past and uh, high praise from John Sheriffs on Honor AP and talk about a, a great uh, starting price point standing for $15,000 his first year at stud in 2021 at Lane's End. Uh, we move along in alphabetical order to the next good looking horse at Lane's End on our coat. From Lane's End Farm, Honor Code, a son of AP Indy out of Serena's Cat by Stormcat, the last great son of AP Indy, a multiple grade one winner on the track, and an Eclipse champion. Honor Code is now the sire of the brilliant grade one winner, Honor AP, who defeated Authentic in the grade one Santa Anita Derby by a resounding two and three quarter lengths. Honor Code is also the sire of another talented colt in the form of Max Player, winner of the grade three Wither Stakes and placed in the Belmont and Travers, both grade ones. A top 10 second crop sire, Honor Code had four yearlings bring 200,000 or more in 2020, including a colt that sold to Centennial Farm for 260,000. From Lane's End Farm, Honor Code. The stunning Honor Code will stand for $20,000 in 2021. And here's some names. Uh, that are progeny of honor code to keep an eye on 2021 a horse they think that we're certainly aware of withers winner max player uh, he's working forwardly at fairgrounds honor rafik she was second in a stake just on the first of january here in 2021 at gulfstream park she's a three-year-old filly who could easily find herself on the kentucky oaks trail that's honor rafik and then creed a six hundred fifty thousand dollar yearling that won his last two races by a combined nine lengths again that is creed so three names uh, sons and daughters of honor code that certainly can make a big run here in 2021. Uh, we move along to a horse that we're very familiar with at Lane's End, Lemon Drop Kid. Well, Lemon Drop Kid is extremely influential for a lot of reasons on pedigree as well as performance. He, um, he's the sire of 97 black type winners, nine grade one winners, and he's the broodmare sire of 64 black type winners and 12 greater group one winners. Um, so he is an absolutely top class stallion. And 
on pedigree. He's by King Mambo, and he's out of a charming lassie by Seattle Slough. Uh, that mare is a half the weekend surprise who's the dam of AP Indy. So these two stallions, both bred by uh, Mr. Mr. Farish and Kilroy, are very special to Lane's End as well. King Mambo stood there, AP Indy stood there, Lemon Drop Kid stands there. Uh, Lemon Drop Kid and um, AP Indy were both Belmont States winners as well. Uh, Lemon Drop Kid was a champion as well at four. It was a black type winner at two, three, and four. And so um, he represents a really important sire line. That is uh, the sire line of Mr. Prospector through King Mambo, which is very rare here, by the way. Uh, but Lemon Drop Kid um, is one of the last few um, sires by that line. But that line is extremely huge in Japan right now. Because, um, as you know, that Philly Amandai, the top-rated horse in the world, is by Lord Kanaloa, a son of King Kamiyamiya, a son of King Mambo. So it's a very relevant line internationally. The Lemon Drop Kid, his influence as a broodmare sire is a, a product of the pedigree, really. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a female line of Lassie deer, and um, the the family has always done well with mares. Uh, right now, he has his most notable mare is um, his uh, G one Kentucky Oaks winner, Lemons Forever, who was a Kentucky Brood mare of the year. She's the dam of two Grade One winners, Eclipse Award winner Forever on Bridal and her sister on Bridal Forever. And, um, you know, his influence is just gonna grow, uh, Scott. Uh, he's got two uh, grade one winners as a broodmare sire by Medallia Dioro, uh, Bar of Gold and Lacte. He's also got a, a, a grade one winner in Europe by Frankel named Without Parole. Now, without parole, Lacte, Bar of Gold, there were by stallions from the Sadler's Wells line as well. So this is a great combination, always has been, of Sadler's Wells combining really well with King Mambo. And um, it's a line, by the way, that also adds a lot of stamina to pedigrees, which is something that uh, you know we need these days. And Really, for the price that Lemon Drop Kid is standing in 2021, uh, it's, it's astounding, really. I mean, his age has really led to why he's uh, standing for a lower fee. But for $15,000, he's an unbelievable stallion, even at his age. And that uh, being Sid Fernando with uh, the breakdown on Lemon Drop Kid, the pedigree consultant. And here's he stands for 15000 in 2021. If you haven't seen uh, a horse by the name of King Angelo, he's a horse that I got a chance to see uh, run on debut on the 20th of December, ran a massive second from an inside post at, at Aqueduct. So King Angelo, a son of Lemon Drop Kid that you're certainly going to want to keep an eye on out in New York for this upcoming season. We move along to one of my personal favorites, the Breeders' Cup winner, multiple grade one winner, Liam's Matt. Wicked Whisper is just a, a beautiful daughter of Liam's map that uh, owned by Alex and Joanne Lieblong. Uh, first time I got to see her was at Robbie Harris's farm when she was training. Uh, very fortunate to have her uh, come into the barn um, with her beautiful first win at Saratoga. First time out, Philly's just uh, obviously uh, gorgeous, but uh, tremendous personality, easy to be around, all class. Uh, won her first race uh, very impressively, followed that up with the frisette, uh, with the frisette score. So uh, no doubt about her grade one quality and uh, just very fortunate to be involved with her. She's a uh, you know, very strong filly, comes from a you know, very good family, um, awfully correct, uh, just a very straightforward business-like 
that um, confirmation wise, she's you can see why she was such an expensive uh, yearling. 2020 has been a difficult year with the cancellations and the change in the schedule early, and I thought it affected her uh, considerably right when we were uh, starting to, expecting to start running her. her. Most of racing canceled, and we've regrouped, and she's had a couple very good runs late in the year, and we're expecting a uh, a very strong four-year-old campaign with her. We will uh, start her 2021 off at Oakland Park. I've been fortunate to have some very nice Liam's map uh, basin. Uh, also, you know, one that hopeful is a two-year-old out of the first crop of Liam's map. Uh, very uh, correct, uh, attractive, uh, good moving uh, colt that uh, is, you know, got moved up in this year's Arkansas Derby. And uh, I... He will, of course, it uh, will have the option of running for a long time. Liam Smap himself is a beautiful horse with a, an elite level of ability that uh, has he's passed along as we've covered. I've been fortunate to have two grade one winners by Liam Smap and, uh, and I'm hopeful to have more in the future. Hall of Famer Steve Asmus and uh, trainer of uh, two grade one winners from the first crop of Liam's Map Basin as well as Wicked Whisper, uh, a horse that certainly we'll be talking about here in the not-too-distant future by Liam's Map, Colonel Liam, a horse that uh, could make a big splash in the Pegasus World Cup turf. Liam's Map standing for $30,000 with that uh, brilliant race record, production, as well as pedigree. We move along to the horse of the year, Mineshaft. From Lane's End Farm, Mineshaft, a son of AP Indy and of Prospector's delight by Mr. Prospector. Mineshaft has been one of the most productive sons of AP Indy at stud. He's the sire of over 50 stakes winners, no fewer than 22 graded winners, and 111 stakes horses. His six grade one winners include stars like FNX, It's Tricky, Discreetly Mine and Weep No More, as well as Dialed In, who is now making a name for himself at stud. Notably, Mineshaft is a top 15 sire by Average Earnings Index, ahead of the likes of Uncle Mo, Malibu Moon, Street Sense, and Empire Maker. And in 2019, his yearlings have sold for up to 380000 From Lane's End Farm, Mineshaft. And the great pillar that is Mineshaft standing for $15,000 at Lane's End added another grade one winner to his resume following True Timber's grade one performance and win in the Cigar Mile back in December. And Mr. Speaker is our next stallion here in the Lane's End Stallion Preview as we take First a look wire, back at Mr. Speaker's at grade post. one winner speech. They're off in the Central Bank Ashland. On Vuitton, Venetian Harbor, joined by Speech up on the far outside. Venetian Harbor will have the early lead and will guide the field down toward the first turn as Speech will go second up on the outside. On Vuitton is in third. A quick check over the left shoulder there from Jose Ortiz as he tries to find some running room down closer to the rail. Carefully starts to move up from in between horses and tries to slide down toward the inside. Bonnie South is fourth up on the outside. Alta's award is fifth early on. It was 24.04 seconds. The time for the opening quarter of Venetian Harbor, the leader. Venetian Harbor on top, a length and a half. Speech travels in second on the outside, three quarters of a length. And then on Vuitant in third, a length and a half, followed by Bonnie South, who is fourth by a length. Alta's award, fifth and last, but right there with the rest as they reach the midpoint of the back stretch. Venetian Harbor, the leader for Joel Rosario. It was 47.14 seconds the time for the opening half mile. Speech on the outside in second. On Vuitton to close third, right behind the leader down toward the inside. And then Bonnie South, outward for the rail in fourth, three lengths off the lead, and a gap of five more back to Alta's award as they move midway on the far turn. Venetian Harbor still the leader. Now here comes Speech, making a more serious bid for the lead as they come to the quarter pole. Half length separate the top two. They've opened up by six lengths on On Vuitton, then Bonnie South, long way back to Alta's award. They turn into the short stretch. Speech, Venetian Harbor. These two going at it as they come toward the final furlong of the Central Bank Ashland. Speech with a narrow lead. Speech now drawing clear by two from Venetian Harbor. On Vuitton and Bonnie South, it is Speech and Javier Castellano to win the Central Bank Ashland. So the grade one winner, Speech, the daughter of Mr. Speaker, winning the grade one Central Bank Ashland. Uh, keep in mind, she ran six furlongs in 109 and two, 
and would go on and win that race at a mile and a 16th, the grade one central bank Ashland. He will stand for $5,000 in 2021. Let's move along to one of the top stallions in central Kentucky quality road. Quality Road, proving Lane's End's tried and true stallion making formula. A formula that leads to success for our partners and our stallions. Quality Road has sired multiple Eclipse Award and Grade 1 winners, including champion two year old filly Caledonia Road, champion three year old filly Abel Tasman, and Grade 1 winners City of Light and Salty. And with million dollar progeny in the sales ring, he's a leader of his generation. Quality Road, a stallion that stands above the rest and stands for $150,000 in 2021 at Lane's End. Want to bring in back in Mr. Bill Ferris to talk about Quality Road. And what does it mean to have Quality Road standing at Lane's End to you? Well, Scott, he was uh, he was a horse. Obviously, we were very, very close to the late Ned Evans. And um, he really uh, was a horse that we followed very closely. Ned wanted him to stand here, which uh, we were thrilled with. And initially, Ned kept the whole horse. Um, unfortunately he passed away after his first breeding season. Um, and we subsequently have syndicated him, but, uh, he's been so successful and, um, uh, it really, it's been an interesting case study to, to watch his stud fee rise. Um, I think this, this year he, he had a very good year, uh, both in the sales ring and on the racetrack, uh, this crop of two-year-olds or the 2020 crop of two-year-olds were uh, bred at a stud fee of 35,000. He then jumped to 70,000. So the two-year-olds for, for this upcoming year will be at a much higher stud fee. And uh, then he went to, to 150 from there um, and has, has just had phenomenal mares. So we're very excited about his two-year-olds, his yearlings, his foals. He's got, he's got so much in front of him. Uh, and having already sired, I think it's 11 grade one winners now. Um, it's uh, he's just a very special horse to us, and uh, and we, we we look forward to what he has in store in the future. But uh, he, you know, even this year at the at the broodmare sale, he had the he was the leading covering sire by median and average, uh, which is which is pretty phenomenal. So um, he's a, he's a great horse to have, and we're lucky to have him. Exciting times ahead, most certainly. One hundred and fifty thousand dollars is what Quality Road will stand for in 2021. We'll move along to the factor. And for more on the factor, here is Brad Cox on one of the factor's top performers in Factor This. Factor This had a great campaign in 2020. Um, he was able to win the uh, grade three fairgrounds handicap, grade two Mervyn Munez, followed up by the um, uh, wise Dan at Churchill. Um, and then um, ran a big race in, in the grade one here at Churchill on Kentucky Derby Day. Um, he followed up the uh, grade one um, placing with a, a grade two victory in the uh, dinner party at uh, Pimlico. So he's, um, you know, been a very consistent horse all year. Um, earned top buyer for um, older male on the turf this year around two turns, I think with a 110 buyer. So, um, you know, very um, athletic um, horse that had a lot of speed that was able to carry around two turns. He's very durable. I mean, you know, he's well, um, you know, he's got a solid 30 starts underneath his belt now in his career. Uh, we have a, another two year old filly, uh, Saranya, that was an expensive two year old in training purchase for Peachtree Stable, uh, John Fort, uh, that has uh, been placed a few times um, here at Churchill. And uh, she's down south at the fairgrounds now looking for uh, big things out of her in 2021. Factor this accounts for a very small portion of the factor's earnings in 2020. So, I think that he's a very solid sire from top to bottom and very um, affordable sire in the uh, sales market. Um, he's a um, very durable uh, dual surface sire that I think has a big future. And there's no question. And, and Brad Cox, uh, certainly one of the favorites for top trainer of 2020. Factor this. I think you've got to factor him right into the equation and conversation for top male, older male when it comes to the uh, turf division in the Eclipse Awards of uh, 2020. So the factor standing for a great price, 17,500 in 2021. We move along to another grade one winner, Tonalist. For more on Tonalist, we go to pedigree journalist, Chris McGraw. First thing I love about Tonalist is 
his page with any stand we're looking for physique pedigree performance three p's but in the round unmistakably there is a ton of two-turn class um supporting tone list damn as we say by pleasant colony sire grandson of ap indy out of an unbridled mare with the second hand by Indijinsky. So sure enough, Tonis came to fame by spoiling the California Chrome Party in the Belmont, but I just love the way he matched that ability to stretch his speed, to win of the Jockey Club Gold Cup, remember, with top class form at a mile, winding up uh, with success in the grade one cigar mile and out, fi- out finishing all bar his stud mate now on a code in the, in the Met Mile. So this was a real throwback career, uh, banking him, million. So while there's no doubt fast mares will complement that two-turn depth to his page, let's remember that this was an absolute machine of a a racehorse who uses great stride with equal effect at 8 and 12 furlongs. Now, Tony, this is a big guy, a good 17 hands, I would imagine, with a lot of that pleasant colony height and range and masculinity to him. So no wonder he adored that, that big oval at Belmont. But he carries himself so classily. The, the mechanics are tremendous. If you look at him walk, you see there's nothing coarse about him. He organized himself so smoothly, so efficiently. I and mean, he accumulated 11 triple digit bears in, in, in graded stakes, 11. I mean, you could absolutely set your clock to tone list. And this athleticism he has means that he should be a much more versatile physical match than many other big stallions. And on the early evidence, we're going to see a lot of that raking stride of his in his stock too, allied to the gut that were, were also his hallmark. So if you, if you just look at the way country grammar scrapped in emulating um, his sire success in the Peter Pan uh, in the summer and has moved to Saratoga, unflinching as he went through that gap uh, to cut the corner into the stretch and then rallying so gamely when he was headed halfway down the stretch. So they have his bone, they have his structure, but most importantly, they have the heart that's housed by all that timber. So the key to, uh, is to remember that Tone List has barely started. Uh, he himself thrived as a four-year-old, and I'm confident that we're going to see the same from his first crop in 21. Uh, it's very promising that his third book was bigger than his second. So breeders obviously like what was coming off the conveyor belt from the outset. In quite a package and quite a price point for 2021 for uh, Tone 12500 is what he will stand for at Lane's End this upcoming breeding season. Uh, we move on in our virtual stallion parade here for Lane's End uh, to the ultra versatile twirling candy. Twirling candy is a stallion that we got heavily invested in um, over the last few years. You know, he brought himself to our attention. You know, every time you pick up a paper, you see whether it's a five furlong turf sprint or a mile and a 16 dirt route, he's there. And he's two year olds, three year olds, four year olds. His crops have really started to rise to the top now. You know, he's got five or six crops on the track. But I think with the fact that he's got four individual grade one winners, he's double digit stakes horses. He made, he made a great impression on us and he's really started to make a wonderful impression on us this year at the sales. We, we found four or five yearlings um, with Donato and Bob and the team to um, go into training next year. And, and that's pretty amazing. It's hard for them to jump through the hoops that we expect them to jump through. Um, they're big, they're robust, they're strong, they're good movers, great attitudes. They've got balance, size, scope and strength. You know, they've got everything that you want to go into a, to a high level training camp with Eddie Woods and head out to California to Bob Baffert. Uh, so, you know, he really has made a very good impression on in the sales ring he's his fertility is amazing uh when you do all the the diligence on twirling candy you will find he's covered i, I believe somewhere in the range of 450 mares in the last three years it's, it's you know it's 
he's got mares from all the good breeders in the country at the moment. He's um, he's a horse that's just making the right steps in the right direction. He's gone from 15 to 20 to 25 to 40, and and we see we see future growth in him. We really do. He's a horse that he reminds us a lot of a horse that like we invested at this kind of stage in a horse like Spice Town. We've invested in horses like Flatter and More Than Ready and Pioneer Denial, and, and you know they, they all had the same attributes at, at this exact period in their evolution so you know twirling candy feels to us like a horse that's he's everybody's horse he's a horse that everybody can use he's 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 a horse that suits a lot of different mares you know and he's a great horse to get a young mare off to a start so you know we feel we've we're only really skimming the surface with with twirling candy at the moment and there's a there's a lot more to come you know one and one of the best um the, the best ways to compare him is to his own sire in, in Candy Ride. And right now he's sitting, I believe, only two or three winners behind Candy Ride at the exact same period in time. And um, he, with, with 20 or 30 less runners than Candy Ride had um, to accomplish that. So, you know, we feel strongly he's on track to become an elite stallion. If he's not already there, and he'll be standing uh, twirling candy for 40,000 in 2021. And you think of the versatility and the types of runners that he gets grade one winner, Concrete Rose or Route Philly uh, on the turf course. Broker Maiden going five eighths of a mile, five and a half, first time out. Gift Box, who we introduced you to, Finley's Lucky Charm, a proper uh, film, female sprinter on the dirt. And then Morticia, a top uh, sprinter on the turf for many years. So, uh, very, very good things to come from twirling candy. Uh, we move along to Unified. And for more on Unified, we'll go to Kenny McPeak, trainer, on why he gravitated to Unified Offspring so much over the course of recent sales. So why does a guy like me go to a horse sale and buy six Unifieds in 2020? They looked the part. And for me, I go look at horses, I look at their bodies, the way they're made, the way they move. I was impressed. Um, no major particular reason why I actually gravitated to their unifieds other than their looks. And uh, every one of them I saw, it seemed like was better than the next. And I've got a list of clients that, that like the physical kind of horses and our fingers are crossed that they, they make stars in 2021 and 2022. He's a stallion that I think stamps his his stock, and um, every one of them I saw had a great hind leg, great shoulders, nice balance. Um, I love the Candy Ride line, and I think Candy Ride and his sons are going to be important in the next several years. The Unifieds that we have uh, breaking at our training center in Florida, Summerfield Training Center, are doing super. Um, they've got good minds on them. They're, the Unifieds are good body horses, and everything we've seen up to this point, we're excited about Unified. I think Unified, of any stallion that I've seen out of the 2020 crop, first crop stallions, Unified's got a huge chance. Yeah. And you consider what uh, Kenny has done over the course of the years in finding horses. That uh, is quite something, the fact that he purchased and acquired so many uh, sons and daughters of Unified over the most recent sales. Uh, exciting times for Unified moving forward. We move along to the next view in our Lions and Stallion Parade, that is Union Rags. Union Rags, proving Lane's End's tried and true stallion making formula. A formula that leads to success for our partners and our stallions. He's a leader in his sire crop by graded stakes winners and grade one winners. He's a commercial standout with multiple million dollar sales and a six figure yearling average. And with four full books bred at 50 and 60,000, he has even more exciting progeny in the pipeline. Union Rags, a stallion that stands above the rest. And standing for $30,000 in 2021 is Union Rags. Want to bring David and Gordo back in to talk about this uh, sire of recent stakes winners, Gulf Coast, Spielberg, a nice uh, debut winner in Defeater, who was a first out winner at the fairgrounds for Tom Amos. Uh, what, how would you sum up, sum up uh, Union Rags, David? Maybe. Do we have David? Sorry, Bill. Yep, here. How would you sum up uh, Union Rags, who we just introduced, uh, who will be standing for $30,000? I think he's a blue 
chip stock in the stallion ranks. And, um, you know, he, he's gone through a little quiet period, but we were expecting that. And he's come roaring out with his three-year-olds this year. Um, that defeater had as good a maiden win as you could have. And, you know, you've got Spielberg, who has got to be on anybody's top ten list for the Derby. And <clears throat> there's a couple other horses out there running around like express train who's four now we're very high on back at home in california and, and another one called wasp uh you know i looked it up he's got i think a couple stakes winners this this past year already uh or in the new year he's got one for sure for the money they're asking for him right now the the future looks very bright at thirty thousand dollars for Union Rags is what he will stand out stand for, uh, and certainly stand out at Lanes and Farm in two thousand and twenty one. Uh, last but certainly not least in this stallion preview for the two thousand twenty one roster at Lanes End, we belong to another champion, West Coast. West Coast champion three-year-old Colt and multiple grade one winner with over five million in earnings. He dominated the Pennsylvania Derby by more than seven lengths and went wire to wire in the Travers, defeating all three classic winners. I would say the Travers was his best performance. He just got out there with that big frame of his and he just galloped away from a fantastic field of horses. A descendant of the AP Indy Sire line, West Coast stands to continue that legacy at Lane's End and doing so for $20,000, uh, an insane pedigree, uh, has the looks. And Chance Tim, Lane's End, joins me again here on this uh, Lane's End Press Pass. Uh, Chance, what have been your impressions in the time now that you've got a chance to spend around this classy colt? Yeah, thanks, Scott. I mean, he's a very strong, imposing type horse. He was an expensive yearling, uh, $420,000 purchase picked out by Ben Glass. Um, you know, he's by flatter. He's a champion out of a champion. Um, you know, he's off to a great start. And really for me, I think this horse fits the mold of, of what is Lane's End. Lane's End has built a re reputation of producing classic sires. And this horse has every opportunity to be just that. Um, you know, he's got first poles on the ground, now just turned yearlings, uh, which we're excited about. Uh, very similar to him. They're very strong, forward, powerful type horses. You know, this horse physically is, you know, the type of horse that a trainer like Bob Baffert loves. You know, they're, he's very strong and robust, has great structure to him, bone and foot, you know, and he can withstand a great amount of training. You know, there was during his three-year-old career, uh, you know, he went on that five-race win streak where he was as good as, as any horse in the nation. Um, in fact, only Gunrunner proved too good, uh, the eventual horse of the year. So, you know, as it sometimes do in this market, they, they forget just how good he was. But, you know, a champion, 117 buyer, five triple digit buyers. Um, and as I said, from what we've seen so far from his foals, he's passing on that strength and robustness. Uh, and constitution that made him such a great racehorse. And, uh, you know, we'll cross our fingers and, and hope that he can pass that on to, their, to his folks. $20,000 is what West Coast will stand for. Everything that you'd want in a stallion. So we look forward to seeing his opportunities moving forward. Um, as far as the, the Lane's End Stallion roster, 21 stallions from $5,000 to $150,000, just about anything that uh, breeders will want uh, here for this upcoming breeding season. All right, uh, with that, we are now going to open the floor to questions. And again, this is how uh, we can ask you to uh, minimize audio issues is by raising your hand virtually. And you can do so by clicking on the part participants button in the lower button, uh, lower center of your screen. That's where that button is located. We'll look for the raise your hand button on the uh, lower right and then look for the uh, raise your hand button on the lower right portion of your panel. And that's how we will uh, call upon you in order to uh, call upon you to get your questions here for this Q&A session. And I will do my absolute best in order to uh, do it in a timely manner as uh, we will sort through 
this. And our first question uh, will come from uh, Mr. Tom Law, who I'm sure will be checking in from Saratoga. First of all, good afternoon, Tom. Uh, what's your question? Afternoon, guys. Uh, appreciate uh, the Farishes and everybody at Lane's End for hosting today. And uh, appreciate you, Scott, showing me some nice weather here in snowy Saratoga. So uh, it's uh, it's been a good winter so far. But uh, I appreciated the comments from uh, John Sheriffs, where he talked a little bit about uh, Honor AP and how he, you know, he was not really mature at two. And, and uh, you know, he talked about him being an athlete ahead of his class. Uh, we know he beat Authentic. Uh, I'm just curious maybe to hear from somebody from the Lanes End team just about uh, how he's uh, matured since he's uh, been at the farm and also maybe to comment a little bit about uh, just how good of a racehorse he really was. Yeah, uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, I'll, I'll let David talk talk on him uh, in a second, but, uh, you know, he, he was a horse, obviously, that uh, being the, the highest priced son of Honor Code in his first crop, David picked him out at Saratoga, um, and you know we we obviously were following him very closely, and we kept getting great reports from the Mayberries down in Florida um, when he was being broken, and uh, again kind of at the head of his class, but but sort of a big baby at that point. And uh, uh, it's the really good ones that that are immature, but yet show that kind of talent uh, all along. And um, David, I'm uh, Happy for you to add into this, but um, he's uh, he's a horse we're very excited about. We obviously wanted to see more from him. We, there was just so much there, and uh, he would have been a, a phenomenal three-year-old later in the year. He ran a tremendous race in the Derby, and if you go back and look at that, you know the 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 distance he ran and the time he ran. He, it really was, I, I, you know, I know that <laughs> doesn't always equate to a win, but. Uh, uh, he really ran a ran a super race, and unfortunately, that was his last. So, uh, but we'll 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 go forward with him uh, with a lot of excitement as far as what his stallion career could hold. David, are you there? Yeah, um, Bill really <laughs> said it all very well. Um, I'm not much of a tweeter, but if you look in my my timeline. When the horse was just in the round pen, um, I was down there and they were putting a rider up and he showed he was special from the first day we we started lunging him and and he never looked back when John got him in. You know, I think he told, you know, he thinks of oh, David, you like all your horses and I was being a little bit waxing poetic prematurely. But the first time he breathed him, he said, OK, you're right. And it, and it went on from there. And, you know, we were heartbroken what happened at the Derby, um, cause there's only one Derby, whether it's in May or September and then they get, you know, injured in a race and not built that we've, uh, on our side of the equation is breeding seven or eight mares to him this year. I'm going to probably buy a couple more in January. We're supporting him. Um, we're going to buy him at the sales. And, you know, we're going to treat him like he, he won some of these big races that he was kind of robbed of the opportunity to run in. And he's one of those horses that uh, really, I mean, from the day that he showed up uh, out here on the West Coast, I think people were just simply enamored with with the way that uh, the way that he looked um, and certainly still maintains that look. Another thing, too, we reminded you at the top, um, if you want to utilize the chat room to ask a question, go ahead and do so. We'll be monitoring that chat room. But uh, Joe Nevels has been very patient here with his hand raised. And Joe, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and, and fire away on the question. Joe, how are you? Doing good. Doing good. Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, so my question for you is, uh, you, get, you have two stallions who recently spent a year standing abroad and then came to Lane's End afterward uh, in the factor and your newcomer Daredevil. Obviously, Daredevil came from a different situation. He wasn't yours before standing here. But beyond that, how do the two stallions compare and contrast in terms of how they've been presented since they've been back, how they've been received, and really just kind of their general career trajectories after spending that kind of semester abroad? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, it, they're, they're very different horses. Um, obviously, um, Daredevil, you know, just, just came out of nowhere in some, in some ways. Uh, I don't think, 
many breeders saw it coming. I mean, he certainly has all the credentials. Uh, we love the fact that he'd buy more than ready and, and uh, gives, gives breeders that, that opportunity to keep that line going. And um, he just, uh, he, he's just a very exciting horse. It's a it's a very strange scenario, and 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 it's something that we're uh, we're excited to take on because it's it's very unique that the that the Turkish Jockey Club continues to own the horse, um, and uh, I don't think they've ever done that. Uh, stood a horse abroad, and uh, you know he, he's uh, uh, they're they're sort of. Uh, it, it's unique because they they buy horses obviously for their breeders to breed to and and for them to recognize the value of this horse over here um, uh, is 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 interesting and we you know we, there were a lot of farms after him and we were we were all trying to position ourselves with the with a scenario that made the most sense to them uh, and they they went from from uh, wanting to sell the whole horse to wanting to keep the whole horse they they, they went a, a, in a complete circle so. Uh, he he's very different. I mean, the factor had been kind of a globe trotter. He you know he he went to Australia for three years. Uh, he started here. He went to Japan for one North American breeding season, uh, and then you know he's he's just a phenomenally consistent horse. It gets a very sound horse, um, and you know for for a stallion like him to be number eight on the sire list, number eight on the sire list, and um, just doing it the hard way, you know, just, just with a lot of good uh, stakes winners, graded stakes winners, uh, and throws the odd grade one winner at you every now and then. And um, uh, so he's he's the kind of horse that I think will be around for a long time. And, um, you know, he, he's very popular with breeders and he gets you a good looking yearling that, um, and then trainers obviously love him because they stick around. All right, Joe, appreciate the question there. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing uh, what he can do next year in the United States, Daredevil. Uh, another hand raised virtually, uh, Katie Ritz. Let's bring in Katie for the question as she's unmuted. Good afternoon, Katie. How are you doing? Doing great. What's your question? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to follow up with um, those comments on Daredevil. And just if you could talk about um, your relationship with the Turkish Jockey Club and kind of what the plan is with him, if he might be going back or if he's if he's here at Lane's Inn to stay. Yeah, it's a great question, Katie, because he's uh, we, we've seen on social media that uh, some of the breeders over there aren't too happy with him being moved over here and that. Uh, but they think he's coming right back, but they've certainly given us no indication that that's what they want to do. Um, he can earn quite a bit of money here as a, you know, being a stallion and, and uh, cat kind of cash flowing for the Turkish jockey club. So uh, they, they really wanted him to be successful here and for him to stay here for the duration of his career. And, you know, I, I, I suppose if he were to uh, fall in popularity here, they would, would definitely entertain maybe bringing him back there, but uh, I think that's going to be a few years down the road if it, if it were to happen, and I don't anticipate that. All right, Katie, we appreciate it. Uh, Joe, I see your hand. Joe Neville's your hand is is it back up or is it stayed up? I believe it maybe is stayed up based on his facial expression there. Joe, do you have another question? No, he does not. Okay, Joe does not have another question here. Uh, in the Q&A portion of this uh, Lane's End uh, press pass. Uh, I do have a question though, uh, Bill, um, <clears throat> just looking at this and going through these, each individual stallion and, and looking at, at their accomplishments and, the, and their physicality, um, how important is it to give breeders all of these options when you've got a horse that stands for 5,000 on upwards and all parts in between up to $150,000? How important is that uh, for the mission at Lane's End? Well, it's very important. I mean, they, they, you know, you're going to, if you stand enough stallions, you're going to hit all the price points, uh, whether you want to or not. We'd, we'd probably prefer for, for them all to be at 150,000, but uh, it doesn't quite work that way. And uh, we've got some very successful horses that are, they're very fairly priced. And uh, certainly COVID has had an effect on some of those stud fees. Uh, we've tried to be responsive to the breeders and, and put the fees at, at fair levels. Um, you know, there's been, been a bit of a, a pause in the yearling market. And I think it, I think 
we anticipate it to come right back, but uh, but you can't really expect breeders to to take that kind of flyer. So uh, we've we've lowered some of our prices, and and I think they're responding really well. What have you learned from from two thousand and twenty, Bill? <laughs> I don't know where to start. Uh, I think we're, we're if we weren't all on this call right now, we'd be watching what's going on in Congress. And uh, I think we're still learning stuff from 2020. But um, it's crazy, crazy time. And uh, I, I don't think any of us anticipated things going the route that it's gone. We're, I think our sport has shown its resilience. Uh, being able to get back to racing before other sports were able to get back uh, to playing. And uh, we just all long for all the things that we missed this year, um, you know, on our, on our very predictable calendars. We all, we all have very similar predictable calendars and, and they became very unpredictable this year. So um, I think, I think I'm going to appreciate all those things a lot more next year. Hopefully uh, there's, you know, they all come off according to plan, but um, it's been a, it's been a very fascinating time for sure. It sure has. I uh, just saw a hand, a couple of hands go up. I'll go in, in order. Ray Pollock, from the Pollock report, uh, just raising his hand. Good afternoon, Ray. How are you guys doing? Um, a question for Bill. Um, are there, when you recruit, when you go out looking for stallions, you know, there's a lot of competition out there, obviously. Do you guys have a certain lane that you get into that maybe other farms don't that, you know, that what, what boxes are you trying to tick or are there some non-negotiables in terms of. Well, there's, there, it's a good question, Ray. There's, there's, you know, some things take up, take us out of boxes that we'd like to be in. Uh, you know, when it, when it turns into an all out bidding war to, uh, you know, for a hundred percent of a stallion, uh, that we're probably not going to be in that in that market. Um, we syndicate all our stallions. We we think that uh, you know having those breeders supporting the stallions and having a vested interest alongside of us is very important. So if I if a if a stallion gets out of the realm of uh, of the share price that we would recommend to our breeders, we we can't we can't chase him. And um, so. You know, and so some of these farms that are breeding such huge books uh, can offer more money. So we're we're up against that a little bit, but we think we've had a pretty good run. We've got a, a bunch of young horses that we're excited about, and uh, so we we really need to to find those horses like with the Wests, where they want to stay in for a big piece, or um, you know, where where the where the owner wants to stay involved with the horse instead of just uh, uh, sell them out. All right, Ray, appreciate it. Uh, Eric Mitchell, the blood horse, the next hand to be raised. Eric, go ahead and unmute yourself. There he is. Uh, good afternoon, Eric. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Bill. Thanks to everyone at Lane's End for continuing this uh, event. Uh, we all wish we could be at the stud barn right now, but uh, so it is, as you said, strange times this year. Um, this question is uh, related to game winner. I mean, y'all have a lot of experience with candy ride. You've now got a lot of experience with twirling candy. Um, from working with those two stallions, seeing what works, mare types, pedigrees, that sort of thing, what kind of insight does that give you for a game winner? Well, it is. it definitely is an advantage. A game winner introduces uh, you know, some AP Indy on the bottom, so it, it takes a lot of those mares out. Um, you know, the, the, the Indy, AP Indy Sire line mares um, obviously uh, have worked well with Candy Ride. So uh, we're, we're looking to other sire lines to, to, uh, to cross with him. Um, but, you know, again, there, there's, there's so, such a, a positive vibe out there for Sons of Candy Ride, thanks to, can, to Twirling Candy, to Gun Runner, to, to Mastery, to, you know, others that are that are out there and that are young and, and on the rise so um, it's it's a uh, it's an easy sell and uh, hopefully it'll be an easy sell in year two and three which is become more and more difficult all right taking a look at our participants uh, any other questions I don't see any other hands uh, risen uh, no questions in the chat room. 
final opportunity to ask a question of the Lanes End team. Reflecting on 2020, looking ahead to 2021, some great questions from some of the top uh, journalists in this game. And uh, not seeing any more, uh, Bill, so I'm going to let you go ahead and put a cap on on this uh, press pass for 2021. Great. Well, I thank everybody for, for coming and being on this. Uh, I know there's, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now, but uh, we really appreciate it. It's an event that we really uh, love doing um, and we don't want to see it die. So we, we're, we're doing it with Zoom and we appreciate you all being on it. And But uh, anyway, again, thanks so much for doing this and, and we appreciate it, the opportunity to highlight our stallions and our roster. And we look forward to next year where we can be back in a newly renovated stallion barn. Well, we look forward to seeing that, Bill. Uh, always a pleasure to catch up. And I'm sure a lot of us will be crossing paths at the uh, the upcoming sale, the Keeneland January sale. So uh, thank you all for joining us on behalf of Lane Zen. Have a great uh, 2021, 2021, everybody, as that wraps up our Lane's End Press Pass virtually.